Magic is in your blood. You breathe arcane power. Your body is the conduit for the ancient energies that suffuse the cosmos. The fabric of the very world is yours to control as easily as a bird flies or a fish swims. You are a sorcerer. Greetings, adventurers. My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. On today's episode, we've got our in-depth class guide to the Sorcerer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. The Sorcerer inherits their abilities naturally, a true-born prodigy of spellcasting. They are one of the most potent arcane spellcasters in the worlds of Dungeons & Dragons. And that means that they're quite a complex class to wrap your head around. In our guide today, we're going to be talking about their different abilities, what spells to pick, how meta magic works, what races and uh, build options you might choose, as well as helping you get inspired about how you might want to role play your sorcerer with all sorts of different tips and tricks for your next game. So let's take a look. Why would we want to play a sorcerer? Well, it's a really cool class. The sorcerer has raw magic in their blood and they get to wield some of the most spectacular and destructive magic in the game, and they really don't have to worry about the consequences. Yeah, the sorcerer is born with their abilities, which means that they just naturally inherited it. So their, their spell casting always seems a little bit more rough around the edges, but mm. also more, more powerful and potent because of that. That might just be my role-playing flavor that I like to add in, but that's the way that it always has felt to me. Yeah, there's kind of this primal elemental energy behind the sorcerer's spell casting, which is really reflected in the fact that they have charisma as their spellcasting stat. Yeah, rather than uh, a lot of the other spellcasters um, that aren't charisma based. Um, that this... tend to be kind of like bookish or more withdrawn. The sorcerer is really out in the world making an impact and changing the world around them. So if you want to really dive into the role playing aspect of D&D, the sorcerer is a great spellcaster to choose. And if you just love blowing stuff up. So the Sorcerer has a really interesting role in the party, and quite diverse, actually, in the fact that it's both a magical, but also a charisma-based character class. Yeah, this means that, of course, if you want to play just a straight-up blaster, and you want to destroy the world with Fireball, the Sorcerer really offers you, uh, I think, the most powerful Fireball in the game. Um, but, at the same time... Because you're powered by Charisma, you get to use skills like Persuasion and Intimidation. Um, this is great if you love to have the spotlight, <laughs> because it means that whether you're in battle or um, in a social situation, your character always has something to do. Now, the Sorcerer can also provide specialist magical support, not quite to the same extent as some of the other spellcasting classes, um, they really have to choose a specialization and focus because they don't know enough spells to kind of cover every situation. But that's worth noting that the Sorcerer has potency in all three pillars of the game, whether that's in combat as a blaster, in social interactions as a negotiator and diplomat, or in exploration by providing spells to help solve problems. The Sorcerer can do all of these things, although you do have to make some very specific choices about what you want your areas of specialization to be. So when you're role-playing your sorcerer, there's a lot of inspiration that you can get from pop culture. Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, and we actually, we do talk yeah. about that, that Harry Potter, even though he's a wizard, um, he, he kind of gets his powers early on and doesn't really understand them and has to learn how to use them and adapt to them. Yeah, and of course, in the, in the Harry Potter universe, there's all the stuff with bloodlines being a, a big impact on how magical power is inherited, which I think is a really cool idea to use for sorcerers when you're role-playing them. That's also something that comes up in the Dragon Age games, where magic is something that people are born with. Uh, you can't learn it, uh, although you can develop the skill of using magic, um, but often there's great consequences and wild magic to using it recklessly. Another great place to look for inspiration is uh, comic books in general. Specifically, I would say the X-Men. Uh, yeah, with, some um, great examples. There's Storm is the quintessential Storm Sorcerer. Storm sorcerer. Uh, but basically all X-Men um, that have kind of spell-casty abilities, uh, X-Men in general 
inherit their abilities at puberty yeah and have to deal with that and develop those abilities and especially because the x-men have like a very specific set of abilities like iceman is just all about frost magic right it gives you this really great archetype that you can model your sorcerer around a, a cohesive theme Continuing with the comic book theme, I mean, you have Loki, Scarlet Witch, uh, there's a bunch of other archetypes out there that you can yeah. kind of base your character on. And of course, if you, we look at our own folklore, there's all sorts of mages and sorcerers to draw on. I would even say that Merlin is another uh, folklore character that he was born with magical power, and if you actually see the weird relationship that Merlin's birth had on his uh, magical development, it's a great archetype to use for a sorcerer. Of course, we can't forget Elsa from Frozen. Yeah, I don't think any episode would be complete without a Disney reference. So that's that's also a great idea for a sorcerer. And um, one of my favorites is Eleven from Stranger Things, who basically, um, there's a lot of things online breaking that team up into a D&D yeah. party, and she's always the sorcerer. Yeah, and, and especially um, characters like uh, Elsa and Eleven... Uh, who their magical powers have so much impact on the people around them as they figure out how to control that power and how to, how to wield it responsibly. Uh, I think that really comes down to where you can get inspiration for, from your sorcerer. They could be um, an arcane artist, or they can be that kind of wide-eyed youth that's still struggling to uh, command their powers, um, or they might just be a complete elemental force of nature. Um, and I think no matter what... Um, all sorcerers kind of have to struggle with that idea that with great power comes great responsibility. And whether or not your sorcerer is able to get control of their burgeoning magical abilities, or they just are the type that let loose, will be a really interesting conflict that informs your character throughout their entire campaigns. So when we're building our sorcerer, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we're going to have to decide on. And uh, they can be a tricky class because a lot of the decisions you make early on, you're going to have to stick with. Yeah, so we're going to go over now some of the ability scores, races, and the different choices you can make with your sorcerer so that you can really get a firm grasp and understanding of all the powers at your command. For ability scores, because you're a spellcaster, you're going to want to look at the ability score associated with spellcasting, which for the sorcerer is charisma. Yeah, this is your most important stat, and it's what makes the Sorcerer so potent, both as a social class and as a spellcaster class. Now, next to Charisma, uh, since you are casting spells, there's another one that me and Monty talk about quite often, and that is Constitution for those Concentration spells. Also, as a Sorcerer, you only have a D6 hit die. You don't have a lot of hit points. So uh, investing in your constitution score is really important to make sure that you're, you're tough enough to keep all this magic from just bursting out of your body or from arrows from bursting into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, beyond that, I mean, dexterity is kind of our third choice just because yeah, of the amount yeah. of saves involved. And it kind of just helps out with your defensive capabilities. And it gives you that uh, crucial initiative bonus that you'll want so that you can throw that fireball right at the beginning of battle. Uh, we were talking about the idea of maybe some of them can even dump intelligence. You don't know how you're casting magic, potentially. You just are. Yeah, and that can be a really interesting tension uh, because often people look to you as the magical expert. You use all those spells, right? But then you kind of have them a blank look and be like, no, I don't understand this at all. I'm not very smart. I'm just very, very charming. So choosing the other stats between strength, uh, wisdom and intelligence. I think that's going to be mostly a role-playing choice. They they don't have a huge impact mechanically on the rest of your character because none of those are going to be strong defenses for you and you might not use those for many skills either. Uh, the next thing we'll want to look at is what races make great sorcerers. And uh, some of the best ones are going to be the half-elf and the tiefling. Yeah, and this is really because both half-elves and tieflings pack a walloping plus two bonus to their charisma scores uh, and a whole bunch of other great features uh, that make great sorcerers. Uh, tieflings come with dark vision and resistance to fire damage. Uh, the intelligence boost is less useful, uh, but if you want to be more of a cerebral sorcerer, that's a good choice. Uh, the half-elf is probably the strongest choice uh, because you're getting extra skills, dark vision, fey ancestry, and another two stat points to put wherever you want, uh, which means that you can boost your dexterity and your constitution and end up with a sorcerer with a really strong stat line at the start of the game. 
Now, me and Monty mentioned this one for pretty much all classes, but the Variant Human is always yeah. a strong option as well. Um, we just love Variant Humans. They're just kind of the bread and butter. Although I will say, I think this is one case where the Variant Human is not the clear winner. Um, sorcerers, because they um, kind of have everything they need built right in, they don't need too much feat support, uh, aside from a few choices that we'll talk about later. There are also a few other races in the player's handbook, like um, halflings, uh, lightfoot halflings, uh, and the uh, dark elves, yeah. drow, uh, and dragonborn, mm -hmm. which all get a charisma boost. So they're all worthy options, just that some of their other abilities don't necessarily line up perfectly with what you want as a sorcerer. There are two other races mentioned in Volo's Guide to Monsters that are uh, pretty good for Sorcerer, and that's the Azamar and the Tabaxi. Yeah, both of them get a Charisma boost and some cool other perks that make them pretty decent Sorcerer. Let's talk about proficiencies. How about uh, that weapon and armor proficiencies? Well, you're a little better than the Wizard. Yeah. Not, not, not much. Really, armor and weapons are, are not going to be your thing, and they shouldn't yeah. be. And, and the sorcerer doesn't really have any archetypes or other features that support ranged or melee combat. You're pretty much going to be relying on your spells, uh, and you get no armor proficiency whatsoever. Uh, so make sure you either pack mage armor or be a dragon sorcerer. Your saving throws are really, really good because the sorcerer is the only class with primary spell casting that comes with constitution saving throw proficiency. And as we said earlier, that is key for those concentration spells. So sorcerers have a really good ability here to withstand damage while concentrating on a spell and have a good chance mm -hmm. of being able to hold on to their concentration. Charisma saving throws are really, really rare, but they tend to protect you from uh, being banished or sent to another plane of existence. Pretty terrible thing to have happened to your character. Pretty great to be able to resist that. <laughs> uh, and finally for skills, uh, as we've mentioned earlier, a sorcerer makes a great social character, so investing in persuasion, uh, intimidation, or deception are great choices. I would probably pick two of the three. Yeah, I usually, if I'm playing a social character, you don't want to dump all of your skills yeah. into, into just being social. You're going to want some other practical things, but taking one or two of those social skills can be really, really handy in role-playing scenarios. Yeah, and I think that if you have a good enough dexterity score, considering like proficiency in thieves' tools or acrobatics or stealth, particularly stealth, because you're going to love the invisibility, stealth, the invisibility spell, um, those are other skills that I would branch out into. I probably would ignore the knowledge skills as a sorcerer and rely on other people to notice things with per perception and investigation. Like we said earlier, there's not a lot of feats that are designed for the Sorcerer. They get a lot of what they need right in the character class, but there's a couple that we could mention. Yeah, I think the first off is if you're planning on playing a Blaster, Elemental Adept is probably one you want to pick up pretty early. As a Sorcerer, you have a very small pool of spells that you know, and they might be uh, concentrated around a particular type of damage, probably fire damage. There's a lot of monsters in D&D that have fire resistance, so Elemental, Elemental Adept is going to help you bypass that. Uh, the other one that we looked at was Warcaster. Yeah, and Warcaster is really just a way of doubling down on having uh, constitution uh, saving throw proficiencies. Uh, you get advantage on top of your proficiency for when you're making your uh, concentration checks. Uh, and it's also pretty cool to be able to uh, hit somebody with a disintegrate spell when they try to move away from you in combat. Yeah. Now that we've discussed some of the main build options for a sorcerer, what are the stuff that comes baked into the class in terms of class features that we might have to decide on later? Well, first of all, spellcasting. <laughs> yes, and as we mentioned, your spellcasting feature of your class gives you spells all the way up to ninth level as you progress. Make sure you check the table to find out what level spells you can cast and how many cantrips you know at each level. The table's also gonna tell you exactly how many spells you know for your level. Um, when you need to find out how hard your spells hit, you're going to want to calculate your spell saving throw DC and your spell attack modifier. Uh, in the case of your save DC, it's 8 plus your charisma modifier uh, plus um, proficiency. your proficiency. And in case of your spell attack modifier, it's your just your modifier plus proficiency. Yeah, so it's pretty easy to remember. Um, and uh, you'll want to keep that 
like front and center on your character sheet because you're going to be referring to that all the time. I actually always put that in um, in my attack section. I just put uh, to hit with spells and yeah. the DC. Instead right of there. writing a weapon in there, just write down Just the write spells. spells. You yeah. don't even need to write a weapon. Yeah. The next uh, big class feature before we get to the sorceress origins is the font of magic ability. Uh, this is unique to the sorcerers and it's uh, related to both their meta magic and their ability to create spell slots so they get even more spells per day. And this is using something called sorcery points. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and your sorcerer level determines how many sorcery points you get when you finish a long rest. And they're the only spellcaster that gets this sort of thing. No, uh, yeah, they are the only spellcaster that gets sorcery points. And you can use sorcery points both to augment your spells with meta magic, which you're also going to get when you learn uh, as you level up, uh, or to create additional spell slots, which is super useful because you can convert your spell slots into sorcery points and vice versa. It's not quite an even trade, but the really useful feature about this is that if you need to throw another cone of cold or high level fifth level spell, you can sacrifice your first level spell slots to turn those into higher level spell slots or vice versa. Just bear in mind a few simple rules. You can never create a spell slot higher than fifth level using your sorcery points. And any spell slots that you create with your sorcery points disappear once you complete a long rest. You don't get to hang on to them. No, you don't get to hang on to them from one day to the next. And that was, uh, that was a bit of a confusion with the early printing of the player's handbook. Yeah, this was an errata, so make sure you check your player's handbook for this feature. The other thing to bear in mind with sorcery points is if you're converting spell slots into sorcery points, your total sorcery points can never exceed what is said on the table at any one time. So just be, be aware of that. Uh, both you're going to use the table of your class to tell you how many total sorcery points you have, and there's a table that also shows you the conversion rate of spell slot to sorcery points uh, right up there. Beyond creating spell slots, you can use your sorcery points for meta magic, which is one of my favorite features of the game. There's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with your meta magic abilities. Yeah. You use meta magic as a way of modifying your spells as you cast them. You spend those sorcery points as you cast a spell to augment that spell in one way. What's important to note is that with most meta magic features, you can only apply one meta magic to a spell at a time. Uh, the only exception to this is in, uh, is empowered spell to deal more damage. One of my favorites personally is the quicken spell ability. Yes, this is probably the biggest draw for many new sorcerers because with Quicken Spell, you can spend two sorcery points to cast any spell that you know as a bonus action. So if you are casting a spell as a bonus action, you cannot cast another spell as your main action unless it's a cantrip. This is a very important rule to remember. Many people see Quicken Spell and immediately think, oh my god, two fireballs per turn. Fireball, fireball. No. You can do Fireball and then Ray of Frost. That's great. Or keep an eye out when you're choosing your spells for spells that allow you to do something as your action because you can concentrate on that spell and change it in some way and then still cast a Fireball as a bonus action. But you're not going to be able to have Fireball and Greater Invisibility happen at the same time. You'll have to uh, separate those castings across turns. Another one of my favorite meta magic features is the twinning spells. Yes, this is a very expensive meta magic because you have to use a number of sorcery points equal to the level of the spell. But it can be really handy. Uh, one of my favorite ones is the twin haste. Or twin polymorph. Yeah. Uh, I also like the new spell in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, twin mental prison. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Just remember when you are twinning a spell that the spell must be a spell that only targets one creature other than yourself. Um, if the spell is capable of targeting more than one creature, such as uh, Scorching Ray or Magic Missile, you can't twin that spell. Furthermore, if it's a spell that you've cast at a higher level, you can that then allows you to target multiple creatures. For example, Hold Person, you can't twin that spell when you cast it at a higher level, but you can twin it when you cast it at its base level. 
What are some of the other meta magic features that we like? I think Twin and Quicken are probably the gangbusters yeah. of the, the, the meta magic. But many people often pick up a heightened spell, which allows you to spend three sorcery points to impose disadvantage on one creature making a saving throw against your spell. This is great if you love those status effect spells. And uh, um, Empowered Spell, which allows you to re-roll uh, a number of dice equal to the spell level. Uh, this is a great way of, uh, if you get a really sad fireball with a lot of ones, scoop them up, roll them again. Um, some other ones that may be worth considering, um, depending on how your group plays, are Careful Spell and Subtle Spell. These are spells that change either how much noise you create when you cast a spell, or actually who is even affected by a spell when you cast it. Um, oftentimes, uh, people ignore the tactical uses of these meta magics, but they can have some really key advantages. So don't write them off because they don't have the raw power of Quicken and Twin. So what about our Sorceress Origins? This is uh, one of the fun things you get to pick to really define what kind of sorcerer you're going to be. But it's a big choice because unlike many other classes, the sorcerer has to choose their sorceress origin at first level. Uh, it's a big choice and it's going to define your sorcerer for the rest of their adventuring career. Your sorcerer's origin never restricts your spell selection and ultimately a lot of the power of your sorcerer is going to come from your spells and your meta magic, not so much your origin, with a few key exceptions. So first off we have the uh, Draconic Ancestry origin yeah the draconic bloodline draconic bloodline, uh, and yeah. i think this is the quintessential sorcerer in my mind they they get their magic from dragons yeah if how you're, cool is that yeah so somewhere in your ancestry your great great granddaddy or grandmammy was a dragon uh, and you've inherited all this magical power from that lineage uh, i love this idea and as a dragon sorcerer you're going to get uh much more resilience you get extra hit points and built-in bonuses to your armor class, uh, so you get a really tough character. Uh, and as you level up, you'll actually be able to uh, grow draconic wings. Uh, so all the great defensive advantages that you want as a sorcerer are baked into the class. And so you, you get to fly. Yeah, and you get to fly. So you don't need to spend your very precious number of spells known on defensive abilities. You kind of get that nice package right at the beginning. And who's not going to love choosing what color dragon you're related to, and then getting a damage bonus with spells associated with that dragon color. Another one, and one of my personal favorites, is the wild magic sorcerer. Yeah, and now you have to be careful with the wild magic sorcerer because it kind of gets a bad rap. Um, that big, beautiful wild magic table has a lot of scary things that can happen every time you cast a spell on it. Uh, and for, for what it's worth for myself as a DM, when I have a wild magic sorcerer, I love rolling on that table, and I like to see it happen as much as possible. Um, the DM has a lot of choice with wild magic, uh, and they can choose not to have you roll on that table. And I actually think that's to the detriment of the fun of the wild magic sorcerer. Yeah, and I find a lot of players who enjoy the kind of um, chaos of a wild magic yeah. sorcerer. Like, one of our players in our game uh, just loves rolling on random charts. Anything that involves that makes them happy. It's pretty potent. Uh, and I think that if you're going to play the Wild Magic Sorcerer, though, you should talk to your DM about expectations with it. Uh, and just be aware that it is totally possible to fireball your first level party by mistake with a Wild Magic Sorcerer. That happened to us. That has happened, and it's very sad. Um, <laughs> although for role-playing opportunities, if you want to tap into the raw elements of being a sorcerer and uncontrollable power, Wild Magic Sorcerer is, is a good the, way to go. It is the way to go. What about the Xanathar's Guide to Everything options? Well, the first one, and I think the one that many people are excited about, is the Shadow Origin Sorcerer. That's, I think, what I want to play yeah. next. Uh, and first of all, I love the quirks associated with this archetype. You, you blinked once like a week ago. Yeah, or like your super, heart super beat cool. once and it surprised you. Yeah, but it's great. you also get two really cool abilities. The first thing is that you can learn the darkness spell. Yeah. And if you spend sorcery points, you can see in your own darkness. By the way, when you cast darkness, you can't normally see in your own darkness spell. So this is a pretty big advantage. And uh, the Hound. The Hound of Ill Omen. Yes. Love it. You get this shadowy Hound that leaps forward and attacks an enemy 
and then basically lets you uh, cast a spell on that enemy. And then they have disadvantage on their saving throw if the hound is adjacent to them. Yeah. It costs three sorcery points to summon the hound. You have to choose who you want to sick it onto. It's pr pretty much like getting heightened spell for free uh, without having to sacrifice a meta magic slot. You still have to spend the sorcery points. Though. So you see that big bad guy and you just sick your hound on him and now they have disadvantage on all of the spells that you're going to be casting up. What about, we also have the... Uh, the divine soul. The divine soul. This one might be the most transformative of all the options that we've seen. And many people are really excited about this one because as a divine soul, you get access to the entire cleric spell list for your spell selection. And the sorcerer spell list. And, yes. So you get this giant pool of spells. There's pretty much every spell in the game you have access to. But of course, you only have a very limited number of spells known. But that also makes this a very diverse option because do you want to be a sorcerer that's a healer? You can be. Yeah, but you could also pick up the really awesome damage dealing cleric spells and the amazing buffs, which you can then transform with uh, Quicken Spell and Twin Spell and all the other meta magics. So it's a really, really potent idea. So lastly, we have the Storm Sorcerer, which uh, was probably the least impactful to me in Xanathar's Guide. Yeah, it was actually originally introduced in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. Um, I think it's a cool one because it has neat abilities with flight and extra damage with lightning magic. I just think it's really narrow. I wanted to see more of like being able to be Storm and like do like crazy stuff. I think storm you can abilities. totally be Storm from the X-Men with the Storm Sorcerer. I think what, what really aids that is the fact that you get to fly a little bit after you cast your lightning damage spells, which really helps live the fantasy of it. Yeah. I think the, my, my biggest issue with the Storm Sorcerer is that there's just not a lot of spells that deal lightning damage right now, um, especially compared to the other elements. Let's talk about spells. The main event. This is really what we're here for. Um, your spell selection is probably going to define your sorcerer as much as your uh, sorcerer's origin or your metamatic choices. But one of the things that you need to keep in mind about the sorcerer is that you're only going to get a total of 15 spells. Over your entire level 1 to 20 career as an adventurer. Most of the time you're going to know far fewer than this. So you need to pick and choose very carefully what is going to be best for the type of sorcerer that you want to play, what's going to be useful to the party, and just be awesome for you. One thing that is important about the sorcerer is that when you do level up, in addition to usually learning one new spell, you can choose one spell that you already know to forget and replace that with another spell up to the highest level spell you can cast. This means that over the course of your career, you can gradually uh, reduce the number of low level spells that you know and swap them out for higher level spells. Yeah, so you can really optimize the power of your sorcerer. Yeah. Now, we've categorized our spells into four main types. Our damage dealing spells, our battlefield control spells, our emergency spells, and our utility spells. Um, we're going to talk about a few suggestions for each of these categories for your sorcerer. The final thing to bear in mind is that as a sorcerer, you do not have the ritual casting feature. So even if you learn spells that you can cast as rituals, uh, you actually don't have the ability to cast them without using a spell slot. So let's talk about those damage dealing spells. Yeah. What are your favorites, Kelly? Well, I like fire. So I mean, fireballs in there. Yeah. I think burning hands. Burning hands is a Flaming good, sphere. Yeah. Scorching ray are all going to be great picks for your kind of fire theme. Probably capping off with Wall of Fire and Incendiary Cloud. We like fire. Yeah, we, we like it. It's a really good package. Um, I would probably keep Fireball for my entire adventuring career. I think every sorcerer probably is going to pick it up. Um, but ones like Burning Hands and um, Flaming Sphere are going to be the low-level fire spells that I eventually want to trade out for like Wall of Fire and Incendiary Cloud. Now, if you do want some, some other elements, are there any good ones that you can think of? Lightning Bolt is great. Yeah. Um, Ice Storm and Cone of Cold are really potent. Um, and, of course, Chain Lightning. Chain Lightning's fun. Yeah. Uh, and who could forget Disintegrate? Disintegrate. Everybody needs Disintegrate. It's a great candidate for Twin Spell. Hitting yeah. two creatures with Disintegrate, pretty awesome. You want to be the coolest sorcerer on the battlefield? Twin Disintegrate? Yeah. Or maybe Twin Finger of Death. 
that also can pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, pretty potent damage dealing. This is why sorcerers rock. Battlefield control spells. What are some of our good options there? So I think sorcerers are really good at using the ones that uh, target saving throws because they get um, heightened spell to impose disadvantage on yeah. them. So I really like uh, ones like sleep, hold person, uh, hypnotic pattern. Love that one. Um, I would even say um, confusion might be an interesting choice uh, and dominate person and hold monster. Next up, we have our utility spells. Yes. Um, utility spells are ones that are going to affect your movement, are going to help you solve problems uh, in the middle of both an adventure, exploration, or even in combat. I would put in spells like um, Misty Step here uh, and Dimension Door. Really, really useful ones. Uh, invisibility, is that a... Yeah, I think invisibility has both utility and combat applications. And of course, Haste. Haste. Which is an amazing combat utility spell. And you mentioned buff. earlier twinning yeah. haste on yeah. your two uh, big damage dealers in the party. Yeah, haste or haste. twinning polymorph is super useful. I think polymorph is another one of those ones that because it's just so flexible, you can use it to deal damage by turning into a T-Rex, or you can use it to solve a problem by turning two of your party members into giant eagles and then having the other two party members ride the giant eagles. Right? Problem solved. Problem solved. Yeah. Right, um, it's a great one, and of course, greater invisibility would be another one because again, you can twin that one and get the rogue and the ranger invisible for uh, infiltration moment. And then we have emergency spells, which um, I'm going to say one right off the bat here that I think every spellcaster should take, and that's shield uh, and counterspell. And counterspell; those are actually the two key ones. If you don't take those spells, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, uh, I think that sorcerers ultimately. Um, they get very few defensive spells. You still do get things like Mirror Image, mm -hmm. um, but you're so restricted on your spell selection that you really want to pick one really key defensive spell. And I think Shield and Counterspell are going to cover you for most of the really, uh-oh, moments you're going to run into. Yeah. As you get into higher levels, um, I would really think about your spells quite carefully. Um the high level spells, because you typically only get one 6th, 7th, 8th, or ninth level spell slot until very high levels, picking a really good candidate for twinning, like Disintegrate, or Finger of Death, or Power Word Stun, doubles the mileage of your high level spell slot, so it's super effective. Many sorcerers are also going to choose Wish when they get to high levels, because it's... Wish lets you have... A full spell list again. There are some other good options in yeah, there. Yeah, like but, Meteor Swarm. But is it as good as Wish? For destroying the world? Well, maybe. Maybe. And Xanathar's Guide to Everything also has a few good picks, like uh, Thunderstep, Synaptic Static, and Mental Prison. All great spells for... Uh, I love Thunderstep because it combines damage dealing with teleportation. Yeah. Uh, and kind of kills two birds with one stone. So let's take a look at some of the role-playing ideas that we have for your sorcerer. Yeah, and I hope that by looking at the build options, you're already getting inspired for what kind of personality your sorcerer might have. But there's lots more to the sorcerer than just the spells they sling. Style is a big thing about wielding magic with gusto. One of the main questions that you're going to want to ask yourself when you're creating a sorcerer is... Where did your powers come from? Like, where, where, yeah. when did they develop? How did they develop? What did that look like? And this is deeply connected to your choice of sorcerer's origin. And because this is a, a choice you make at first level, your sorcerer has this built-in story, both in the mechanical choice that you made of the spells that you know and learn, uh, and your origin. So think about that really, really tightly. Like, maybe your sorcerer is of draconic ancestry and they come from a proud noble house where that sorcerous bloodline is always coming back up in like maybe the third child of the family is always the sorcerer and you have this great legacy behind you of your great grandfather or great grand uncle was a great sorcerer and you have to live up to that. I also like going the other way which is the complete accidental sorcerer which is just like a family gives birth to a child and oh my gosh they have magical powers and nobody knows what to do or why it happened and yeah. they have to deal with that being somewhat of an outcast in their society just being like i don't know why i have these powers sorry everybody Learning yeah how to control you can also them. get some of that like i am the chosen one thing happening like if you're playing a favored soul or maybe you inherited a curse 
and you were born on the Shadowfell, and that's why you're a shadow sorcerer. Uh, uh, I also love the story of like the um, the child that's born in the middle of a shipwreck being a storm sorcerer. One of the other things that I know that we talked about with uh, coming up with your sorcerer was was like the way that they cast spells and what that feels like. Yeah, I think that like as a sorcerer, your magic is coming from your body, right? Um, and what happens when you cast a spell? Do your eyes light up? Does your voice change in its resonance? Do you float off the ground a little bit as you cast a spell? Uh, maybe you're like Eleven from Stranger Things, and when you wield your powers, your nose bleeds, right? Uh, or um, all the veins in your body like start to glow yeah. or pop out. I love this idea that like sorcerers have some sort of physical or emotional exertion connected to casting their spells. Yeah, there's um, there's the way that a lot of people look at sorcerers with just like flinging spells like it's no big deal, but I think it's even cooler to have a sorcerer who exerts so much of themselves in order to cast a spell because yeah. it's coming out of them. Yeah, it's like an expression of what's happening inside them. Um, I love this idea that like maybe some of your spells are actually associated with an emotion or a memory. So like... The first time you cast Fireball was this desperate moment that you needed to do to save your friends. And from then on out, afterwards, whenever you cast Fireball, you need to conjure up that memory, that emotion, uh, and use that to channel the magic. And if, um, if all of your ancestors were also sorcerers, there's this really cool idea that you actually have memory. Yeah, genetic memory. And when you cast a spell, you get like a flash of your great grandfather or great grandmother casting that spell as well and maybe these visions that you get actually can inform your quest yeah so these are all just little little ideas here um you can take all of these little bits and you can kind of put them wherever you want piece them together and create your own backstory and really cool ideas for how to play your sorcerer yeah um and as i said your sorcerer might kind of see themselves as a savant or a prodigy or an artist uh, on the flip side, they could be almost completely innocent and they could be really struggling to understand this power of like, why am I suddenly setting things on fire around me when I get upset? Um, and they're kind of thrust into extraordinary circumstances with extraordinary powers. Uh, I think the sorcerer kind of, um, because they don't understand what's happening with their magic, it's a great role-playing opportunity to want to discover and understand uh, that power. Um, and so all of this feeds into that core motivation for your character. Do they want to understand their power or do they want to wield it? Do they want to find out their history, the mystery of their birth? Uh, or do they just want to use their power to change the world? Um, I think the sorcerer has this big idea behind them of like, I can just exert this power and I can change the world around me. So maybe I can change the world for the better as a whole using this power. So that's our guide to the sorcerer. We hope that you feel inspired and you're willing to create some awesome characters in your game. And of course, if you had played a sorcerer already, we would love to hear about your suggestions, tips, uh, spell cho choices, and your epic stories of how your sorcerer wielded their magic in their game, especially if you have any hilarious instances of when you rolled on that wild magic table. <laughs> If you're looking to better understand how spellcasting works in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, we have a video on that right over here. And a useful tool and accessory for all sorcerers are the D&D Spellbook cards, which you can find about in our video right here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon! dungeon.